Good morning to one and all. I, Nayanaji, on behalf of Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, feel ple pleasure to introduce our resource person, Professor Richard Pinto. Professor Richard Pinto received the B.Sc. degree from the University of Mysore with highest honor and Ph.D. degree from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR, Bombay, on the thesis, I feel effort in disorder semiconductor. He has credit of building silicon devices processing facility at TIFR, which pioneered early works on small-scale ICES in the country. Later, he initiated work on charged couples imaging devices at TIFR after returning from Allen Clerk Research Center, UK. He established advanced laboratory at TIFR for the growth of thin films, microwave devices, and also contributed extensively on multiferroic and colossal magnetoresistive thin films and devices. In 2002, Professor Pinto joined Micro Nano Electronics Group, IIT Bombay, as a member of faculty to work on advanced silicon devices and played a re leading role in building nano fabrication facility in IIT Bombay. Professor Pinto has authored over 250 research papers published in referred journals and has delivered many talks at national and international meetings. He also has served as a member of many review committees and as a subject expert in DHT. Currently, he is Professor Emeritus and Dean Research at Alvas Institute of Engineering and Technology, Morbidre, and has planned to initiate Alvas Center of Advanced Research and has worked extensively on hydrogen and methanol fuel cells and has six patent applications and seven publications in this area. I'm honored to have you online. I welcome you to this FDP program, sir. Over to you, sir. Good morning, all. This talk is going to be a little different from the MEMS talk itself. Uh, MEMS talk, which is the type, uh, theme of this FTP program, MEMS and Nanotechnology. I'm going to in introduce new area called fuel cells and the role of MEMS in fuel cell technology. Uh, I've been here working here for the last uh, three, three and a half years. And I'm very happy to state that this fuel cell technologies have been, uh, we have been able to use extensively in this institute, but in collaboration with both big, uh, my earlier institutes, Tata Institute of Phenomenal Research and IIT Bombay. So I'll be giving an overview of what I will be, we have done over the last few years and what is the current status at the world level. Uh, outline of my talk is the following need for clean energy, feasible source of energy, current status, and a little bit of role of MEMS in fuel cells. So MEMS will be a very small part of this talk, but I'll be covering uh, I'm quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The role of MEMS in fuel cells is a part of my talk here, but major part of my talk, as I mentioned earlier, is in fuel cells. Now, uh, I will be covering quite a bit of my uh, my time on hydrogen fuels, which are going to be extremely important in the years to come and work carried out at this institute, AIT, Alvaz Institute of Engineering Technology, and some of the future directions. I will wind up with some future directions, which are in the fuel cell, how MMs can play an important role in fuel cell technology. Uh, the need for clean energy, as you know, let me start with the energy idea itself. As you know, uh, energy is very vital, just like food. Energy is vital for mankind. And the clean energy is the issue which all of us are facing with. Uh, the currently, our machinery, all the work we do is uh, basically using oil, you know, petroleum products. And oil pollutes and there are limited supplies. There are two problems. One is the pollution, other is the limited supplies. Oil, uh, that way, has to find an alternative. So uh, there have been many, a lot of work has been carried out, uh, done in the, during the last many years. I'll be quickly covering some of them before we go into the uh, MEMS itself. 
Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the known universe, which you know all, many of you would know. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the known universe. Hydrogen fuel cells do, do not pollute. If you can make hydrogen, the fuel cells with hydrogen as a fuel, then it will be a great achievement. Will be very, uh, will be very, very useful in the years to come. Okay. Now let me just mention about the feasible source of energy. Uh, we have photovoltaic solar cells. Uh, as we solar cells are already 50 years old, but in the last 10 years they have made rapid progress. And the problems have been, uh, you know, the uh, reliability and the efficiency. Now, amorphous solar cells have a low cost, but over the years, they have lost the importance because of the reliability issue. Whereas on the other hand, crystalline silicon solar cells have really made rapid progress because of the reliability over 20 years, 25 year lifetime. The vibrations based energy harvesters are also uh, used like piezoelectric, capacitive and inductive based. But we see on the right side table, and the uh, in this slide it shows power densities of energy harvesting technologies. Harvesting technology on the left side and power density on the right. If you see solar cells give the maximum power densities, the 15 milliwatt per square centimeter. Whereas piezoelectric gives 330 microwatts, and they are used. Some of them are used in shoe inserts and so on. For, basically for some application, basically for as toys. Vibrations based uh, uh, also uh, can be used, but the problem is again the low power density, 116 microwatt per centimeter cubed. This volume is given when a solar cell is per square centimeter, all are used as volume because there's a certain volume required. Whereas solar cells require only surface. The thermoelectric, uh, another a possibility, but they're given lower power density, so 40 microwatts per centimeter, and per centimeter cube. And acoustic noise is nanowatts, 960 nanowatts per centimeter cube. So there are all kinds of uh, power densities possible, power sources are there, but they have been, uh, you know, very low power. Throughout, they have been able to, not, they were not able to give a considerable amount of power. So what is the alternative then? So, as you see, uh, solar panels have made rapid progress in the last 10 years, especially during since 2015, when uh, uh, large panels were introduced, low cost panels were introduced. There was, a, there was a reduction in the cost of solar power as compared to the conventional power. So, 2015 was a cutoff point where solar power came down below the conventional power. That's why you see solar panels. Uh, gigawatts panels used, uh, you know, installed in many states, including uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and even Karnataka, they are installed. Gigawatt panels, 1000 megawatt panels. So that is a huge power compared to the uh, conventional power, which is done by hydroelectric or atomic energy or by coal. Coal has been used quite extensively, but is, is you know, is highly polluting. The common energy harvesting system, you know, you have uh, just to give a few slides here. So you have traffic signals, you can use solar power, Mars rover, use solar power. That is then used when a low power modules used because of the various issues. But I talked about the large generating power station, which requires large area panels, gigawatt panels, large area, which is stationary application, which is used in the grid application. This is another example I'm giving, just to give, just to show you how it could be used in solar power, various uh, levels. Wireless weather stations you can use, implantable medical devices, the battery power is used. So that is actually battery technology, it is not solar power. But they are low power application. Now here you give, a, I give two important applications, large scale applications. One is solar, which I mentioned, gigawatt panels. On the left you see solar panels, the right, you see the mechanical uh, part, which is wind energy is used using big, uh, wind, uh, wind, uh, wind turbines. Wind uh, is used, to, you know, wherever there's a large wind, for example, in Holland, it's very windy and they're used extensively there. India, they're not very used very often because wind has been not been very predictable. With the result, solar panels have make, make, made rapid strides in India. 
Now, of course, there's a thermal power, can use to some extent, extent and electromagnetic to another extent, but the problem is they have been very low power, power densities. Uh, now, to give, describe a little bit staying on this problem, challenges from different sources. Let me, let me just give you light, confirms to small surface area, 10 microwatts, 15 milliwatts. I mentioned 15 milliwatts earlier, that the maximum power you can get in a full, uh, during the noon from the sun, using the current 18% uh, uh, efficiency solar panels. Vibrations, of course, give very low power. And thermal, of course, another even lower power, something like 15 microwatt. So uh, there are the challenges. Uh, let me see, go to the switch gears now. I gave a background to you. What is the current status of energy? And why fuel cells can play an important role? Now, as, I, as you see, solar power is the most important power so far. And rightly so, because most, almost all our energy on Earth comes from the, from the sun, In, including the oil and all gas elements. Everything comes from, came from the sun only. At some stage, it got converted into high pressure, high densities. It got converted into uh, crude oil. So everything came from the sun. So now, what fuel cells are, how fuel cells are different from uh, other source of energy. So let me go, to, go give you one basic picture so that it becomes very clear to you because the picture is better than a thousand words and uh, is better to explain through a pic uh, picture how it looks like. There are various kinds of fuel cells, uh, solid oxide fuel cells and so on. I won't go into those details. They are very special cases and not be used in a, a large extent. Uh, the most important fuel cell is the proton exchange membrane fuel cell. Okay. This is shown here. Is on the right side is a figure. Uh, you have a, a right in the center. There's the electrolyte, which is a membrane, on the right side. And on the left side there's an anode, and the right side is a cathode. Now anode, uh, you can use many uh, fuels. The most common used fuels, two types of PEM fuel cells are currently uh, under development, and some of them are also being used now to some extent. One is methanol based, methanol is a fuel. So methanol goes into the bottom part here on the left side, fuel in and comes out from the top. On the right side, air breathing, it is there because you need air, of course, or oxygen. So oxygen comes out, comes in, goes in and comes out. So it's called air breathing. Uh, this uses a polymer membrane as the electrolyte. Now polymer is right at the center, which is shown as uh, the H plus is there, right in there you see. The gray color is the electrolyte, which is a membrane. Operates at relatively low temperature, about 30 to 60 degrees Celsius. Has a high power density. Now mark, just see that high power density, I'm stressing again, can vary its output quickly and is suited for applications where quick startup is required. Uh, is required making it popular for automobiles. <coughs> Sensitive to fuel impurities. These are, of course, you need to have reasonably clean fuel. Otherwise, the efficiency will go down and you have, your membrane also may get contaminated. Okay. Just give me a little more details about the fuel cells. On the left side, in the top, you see what happens is your fuel cell, fuel enters on the left side at the anode. Okay. It gets broken into H plus and other uh, impurities. For example, in the case of methanol, you get carbon dioxide as an unwanted product, and H plus is high proton goes into the membrane. Right on the center, it is shown there. Then on the it moves as the proton moves into the membrane, and then comes out in the cathode on the right side. Okay, and the electrons are coming out in the external circuit, and then you generate. Uh, uh, external current, uh, which is shown by a lamp there. And finally, exhaust ex uh, exhausts are coming out on the right side. So this is only schematic, but give more details. You know, right side, this one, of course, this is again a schematic. You have a fuel coming into the anode catalyst, gets converted into H plus, 
and the electrons move in the external circuit okay and then electrons meet in the external go into the cathode side and meet h plus with oxygen giving rise to water is the exhaust this is the simplest uh, you know very simplified uh, very simplified uh, uh, figure which is easy to understand so we have a anode catalyst have a cathode catalyst fuel goes into the left side and the anode gets broken into h plus h plus moves into the polymer membrane and then comes into the cathode and you get a product called water which is clean but in the case of uh, methanol it is not clean because it gives rise to carbon dioxide at the anode itself and methanol is broken into h plus and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is a non wanted product but that is a drawback of uh, direct methanol fuel cells okay now uh, before i go into the details let me give one more slide hydrogen fuel cells are type of electrochemical cells hfc generate electricity by reduction and oxidation reaction within the cell we use three main components fuel an oxidant and electrolyte which is operate like batteries although they require external fuel hfcs are thermodynamically open system hfcs use hydrogen as fuel oxygen as an oxidant a proton exchange membrane and as an electrolyte and emit only water as waste so they are the ideal situations okay ideal situations for energy generations so as you go along i will stress more on that okay now chemistry behind the technology there is going to the chemistry okay at the anode of the cell a catalyst platinum nanoparticles powder you mentioned the powder they actually nano state because uh, it acts as a much powerful catalyst in the nano state is used to separate proton from electron in the hydrogen fuel cell anode arc reaction is h2 2h2 gives rise 4h plus plus 4 electrons and you e plus electrical and generation energy is zero energy is generated on the right side you have the cathode part at the right cathode of the shell a second catalyst nickel is mentioned there actually nickel is not that efficient nowadays only again platinum is used and why hydrogen fuels have not made rapid progress i'll tell you later because one of the problems is expensive cost of platinum is used to recombine protons electrons and oxygen atoms to form water cathode arc reaction is shown here 4h plus plus oxygen plus 4e electrons you rise to two molecules of water and you generate elect energy uh, voltage of 0.68 volts that is a, a voltage generator okay. in electrochemistry e zeros of the cell value of this uh, uh, this fuel cell is equal to the e0 of the cathode arc reaction minus e0 of the anode arc reaction for a hydrogen fuel cell the two arc electrons arc reactions are shown above so to calculate the energy of one fuel cell we need to sub subtract the anode energy from the cathode energy for an hfc e0 cell equals 0.68 volts minus 0 volts which gives you 0.68 volts that is the voltage the current power depends upon the current drawn which it depends upon many other conditions which I, as you go along i will explain major types of fuel cells in general all fuel cells have the same basic configuration and electrolyte and two electrodes different types of fuel cells are classified by kind of elect electrolytes used the type of electrolyte used determines the kind of chemical reactions that take place and the temperature range of operation Now, I'm, I'll be talking about only two very important types of fuel cells. And one of them is uh, directly use MEMS technology for fabrication. That is direct methanol fuel cells. Now here, expected efficiency are 40% plus low operating temperatures between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. This is the advantage. Also uses a polymer membrane as the electrolyte. Different from PEM because its anode catalyst is used and able to draw hydrogen from methanol without a reformer. Actually, this is, uh, is uh, they're not going into the details, uh, maybe more technical. Used more for small portable power applications, possibly cell phones and laptops. So they have got very limited applications uh, because of the, uh, you know, 
power generation is not very high, but they are safe because they use only methanol. But there's a drawbacks are power generations are not very high and also give rise to carbon dioxide. In principle, and in fact, in reality, they are not clean energy sources. Now, DM, DMFC picture is shown here, uh, which is uh, uh, again, uh, which shows very clearly the schematic. Uh, the byproducts include water and carbon dioxide, as shown here. And the reaction is shown above. Anode reaction is methanol plus water gives rise to 6H plus 6E, B minus, and carbon dioxide. And cathode reaction gives 3 by 2O2, 6H plus, plus 6E, which is coming from the external circuit, gives rise to water. The overall reaction is given here in the third equation. Uh, methanol plus 3O2, 3 by 2O2, gives rise to 2 water and carbon dioxide. And this is a redox reaction, oxidation and reduction. First reaction is oxidation, second reaction is reduction, so a redox reaction. So actual picture is shown here. And you see the micro channels. You need micro channels for flow of, uh, flow, as flow channels for the flow of uh, fuel. And they are used, actually, they are actually defined using MEMS technology. I will go into the details later on. Let me just if you take a minute more on this slide. Methanol and water, they enter at the top, flow through the micro channels, and then come out. Carbon dioxide and some un unused methanol also will come out. And they flow through the GDL called gas diffusion layer. So that is diffuses the layer, liquid inside. And then there is a platinum catalyst. Actually, this platinum ruthenium catalyst is used on the left side because break methanol, there's a mistake. So platinum ruthenium catalyst should be on the left side, and platinum catalyst on the right side. Platinum ruthenium is used for breaking methanol into carbon dioxide and H plus. Uh, H plus goes into the nephion membrane. Now I mentioned membrane, membrane and I never brought the word nephion. Nephion is a trademark of DuPont. That, been, that has been found to be the best electrolyte so far in all fuel cells. There are others who have tried but not as efficient as nephion. I will, uh, as I go along, you will know why nephion is so important. Okay, so it passes H plus protons pass through nephion, go to the cathode side, and then they meet air breathing, oxygen or air, oxygen from the air, and then combine to form water. Okay, and using again platinum catalyst. So again, you need air breathing, means you need microchannels on the right side, cathode side also. That is also, those are also made using MEMS technology. So you have air going inside, water comes out. So water is a byproduct, but you have a carbon dioxide which is coming out of the anode side, which is unwanted. So that is why these fuel cells are not very clean in the sense you carbon dioxide also is a greenhouse gas and we cannot afford to add carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now we are going something on MEMS, this subject of this uh, uh, MEMS and nanotechnology subject of this uh, theme of this uh, FTP. So uh, let me tell you how we are going to develop uh, flow channels. And we use the silicon technology. Um, you know, MEMS have advanced quite a bit. I remember some like 30, 40 years ago, we, my colleagues, Prakash Apte, uh, he started the MEMS work in TIFR and then subsequently joined IIT Bombay in 2001 and he gave extensive course to MEMS. But this work uh, essentially uses, this work was done in IIT Bombay. Actually. This is actual work was done by a student. Uh, Arjun, uh, who is, is joined as a faculty here, and then uh, is for his PhD work. And I'll give more details about this later on. Let us focus on the actual process of flow channels in for methanol fuel cells. Uh, now we start with the silicon wafer. You can start with 100 or 110. Left side is 110 and the right side is 100. And we use uh, silicon uh, uh, device technology. We, we use oxi ox oxide we grow in silicon, then spin photoresist on both sides. Both sides are required with the back side you have to protect by etchings, oxide and silicon. Now silicon is etched using uh, uh, trimethyl ammonium hydroxide, TMH is called, very famous etching. Or using silicon. Using silicon nitrate as a mask. 
So first you use the through holes. Why you need through holes? You need to get methanol in into the flow channel. Uh, methanol in into the flow channel. We have to get it in. Okay, so we have to make the through holes. In the C, you see the E there. D actually is uh, partially etched. D is uh, TMH etching of silicon using silicon dioxide mask for through holes. Okay, and then uh, while etching through silicon, you go up, up something like you know, silicon we use two inch diameter silicon is about 360 micron thick. You go halfway through something like 180, 200 micron using TMH. Then again, strip the resist and again uh, spin oxide, spin coating again, positive resist on both sides of the silicon vapor, followed by second level UV lithography and development. Etching of exposed silicon dioxide using VHF, TMHing, G is TMHing of silicon using silicon dioxide mask for micro channels. Okay, first mask is for through holes, you see on the through holes through which methanol, the fuel gets in into the micro channels. The fuel comes, gets in from the back side of the wafer, not from the front side. Front side is ma matching with the GDL, as I mentioned in the previous diagram, and next diagram also is there, you'll see that. Front side will match, will meet the uh, gas diffusion layer and the catalyst. But the back side, we allow the methanol to get in, so you need the through holes. So, TMHing silicon dioxide, through uh, using silicon dioxide mass for micro channels. Okay, this is G. And H is you need to deposit the thin layer of metal to get the uh, uh, current electrons out into the uh, external circuit. That's why you need a thin layer of metal because silicon itself is not a very good conductor. So you need a thin layer of metal to get the power output from the cell. So this is the basic schematic. Now, if you use uh, uh, 110, you get a rectangular profile. But if you use 100, you get a tapered profile. You see on the right side is the tapered. You'll see better picture in the next slide. Let's go, let's go to the next slide. So you see a more clear picture. But don't give many, this doesn't give many details, but it gives a final result. You see here, this is uh, uh, this is actually essentially one zero the surface. You see the tapered profile, and you have the through hole here and the micro channels. Now, what we use is a, there are various types of schemes available. You can have serpentine flow channels or cross strip flow channel. We use a cross strip flow channel. It has certain advantages. So, cross strip flow channel is shown here on the right. It's actual picture of a uh, flow channel uh, circuit here. You have the uh, silicon wafer here with size 17 mm by 17 mm. This is the active channel, the active part of the cell. Cell is bigger than this, but active part is 17 mm by 17 mm. We decided to use the smaller size to avoid, uh, minimize uh, the total use of fuel and so on. But this cell is good enough for proving proof of concept. And 17 mm, so 3.1 square centimeter is reasonably large fuel cell. And uh, I will give you the power densities in the ne next few slides. So you have a this is schematic here is a schematic here and actual picture of, a, of the uh, silicon uh, which is used as both at the anode and cathode. Through holes you see there on the top is the through holes and chrome gold coating on silicon channels at the bottom. So this is the actual layer which we use successfully for fabricating and studying our micro, uh, direct methanol fuel cells. Yeah. So microchannels using MEMS technology for DMMC. That is the title of this talk. Let me go to the next slide. Giving you some more details of the flow channels in silicon for anode and cathode of DMMC. This gives you actually the exploded view of DMMC. On the right side and the extreme right and left view of the methanol reservoir, the air breathing tank. This actually, you don't need a tank, it can enter the directly, but for mechanical rigidity, we use a similar thing, a tank like thing. So, methanol reservoir then goes into the flows into the through the through holes into the flow channels. Then we have the uh, C is uh, C is catalyst loaded gas division layer. So, catalyst which is 
this gas tubing layer we call it because gas actually liquid froze to that and then it breaks into uh, carbon dioxide and h plus uh, catalyst or DTL. now this catalyst of course as i mentioned is uh, platinum ruthenium which breaks uh, direct breaks methanol into carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide and uh, h plus then h plus moves into the nephion membrane then similar kind of thing we have on the right side so again uh, gas diffusion layer and oxygen air breathing for the cathode then air breathing tank here so this is the schematic we use successfully uh, it is exported view shows very clearly how we assemble and how we do the me measurement now some of the results which you obtained are interesting now we obtained two important results using our direct method on fuel cells now he shows the schematic of cross-sectional geometry approach channels rectangular one using 110 silicon vapor and b trapezoidal one on 100 silicon vapor micro four channel width is 25 250 micrometer width depth is 100 micrometer and land width in this case w1 is 100 micrometer in this case of course land width is same as the total width is 250 micrometer Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the schematic and we will see the actual picture in the next slide. This is the actual picture of the uh, flow channels. This is a cross-sectional view, but it's just a treated view. Treated view gives you better uh, pictures actually, more electron emission. Second electron emission, you see better picture. You see the cross, uh, in the rectangular one and the trapezoidal one. This is actually the flow channels design which we had in our direct method and flow channels. Now, let us go into some of the performance characterization. This was published uh, in Journal of Micromechanics and Microengineering, quoted to journal two, two years ago. And you see here, these are called polarization plots. Actually, left side is a voltage versus current density plot, and the right side is a power density versus current density, as a function of current density. Voltage, voltage, open circuit voltage high. You now, which I mentioned, uh, six eight. Now you don't get six eight is somewhere yet, which you mentioned earlier equation. It drops very fast when you draw the current, then remains for a short, long time, uh, up to some about twenty five uh, uh, current density. Is milliamps. This should be milliamps. Is actually power density. Not many watts and many amps, the mistake. Okay, so you have uh, this kind of uh, plot for voltage with current density, and this is milliwatts per square centimeter. This is correct. So, milliwatts per square, uh, square centimeter. So, this is the power density on the right side. These are power density, these are voltage versus current density. And this was obtained, left side figure is obtained for rectangular channels, the right side is trapezoidal channels with cross-section trapezoidal type for various methanol concentrations. Of course, it increases with higher methanol concentration, uh, more percent. You can mix with water. They are diluted with water, methanol diluted water. So, so highest is obtained for uh, seven, mo seven molar. Eight molar it drops because oversaturated. Seven molar concentration gives the best result. Here also seven molar concentration gives the best results even for triple zero. But you see the difference between the left side, which is a rectangular channel, and right side is a uh, stepazeral channel. The difference, you see the maximum peak here, seven milliwatts per square centimeter, and here, four milliwatts per square centimeter. So substantial improvement with the trapezoidal channel because of the flow dynamics of methanol in the uh, this thing. There was some I won't go into the details, but the flow, flow dynamics is in better in the case of uh, trapezoidal channel. That is why you see the better output under identical conditions. You get better power output in identical conditions. This, is, uh, this has been, uh, we applied for a patent three years ago, and one for examination. Now, this is one more work we did is, is to increase the power density by reducing the methanol crossover. 
These plots are repeated again, but I won't go into detail. Let me explain what happens. We use uh, PVDF TRFP coating. Uh, here, this is the this is shown correctly here. Platinum ruthenium catalyst on the anode and platinum catalyst on the right side, on the cathode side. This is again exploded view. The problem with uh, uh, these uh, fuel cells is the direct crossover from anode to cathode. Methanol has a problem. Methanol goes, you know, uh, permeability is decided by various factors. If the, if the methanol, without breaking into carbon dioxide and H plus goes into the uh, penetrates to the membrane, goes to the anode cathode side, then we have a short circuit effect. So the power density drops. So you need to reduce the membrane permeability. So one way of reducing permeability is coating a thin layer of another material. What we did was we used PVDF TRP. And this is actually a piezoelectric material. And we used it for our vibration sensors. This talk will be, we had an extensive work on this. Another student, Rashmi, we have, this work is also embedded with development of very low frequency vibrations. So this talk will be given tomorrow by my colleague, Dr. Jaram. So I will not mention about that. But what I am relation to that is the PVDF TRP is one material which is piezoelectric but also helped us here in the hydrogen fuel cell wall, in the direct methanol fuel cell wall. What we did is we coated the membrane with PVDF TRP by just spin coating and then found this effect. You see the schematic here. Before I go into the detail, let me explain in one minute in explaining the schematic. Here it is the self sulfonated PVDF. Why is self sulfonated? I'll explain later on. We have a napier membrane on the left side. We have a coating of PVDF PRP on the right side also. So both sides is coated. Okay, and this is again shown here. This coating is there. Okay, so here are the methanol here. Here are the microchannels in silicon for flow from methanol. And then we have the GDL here, brown is GDL, and then the platinum rhythm catalyst to break. Uh, methanol into carbon dioxide and uh, H plus and then we have a PVDF TRP layer on the Napier membrane. The similar thing happens on the right side also. Only thing is catalyst only platinum, not platinum with any because here hydrogen H plus has to uh, combine with oxygen, air breathing oxygen to produce water. This is the water symbol. This is carbon dioxide. Okay. So this is the current flows in the external circuit. As I mentioned, the cross strip geometry earlier. Current flows, electrons move in the external circuit here and go into the cathode side and then combine with H plus and oxygen. So the current is drawn in the external circuit. So current depends upon the internal resistance of the device. That's like a battery. Uh, lower the internal resistance, higher will be the current you can draw. So internal resistance of the membrane is very important. So if you use a very thick membrane, then uh, you have internal, a large internal resistance. So that means your power output drawn will be less. At the same time, if you use a, a thin membrane to increase the power density, then methanol crossover will be large. The result is then you have a trade-off. You need an optimum balance between thick membrane and thin membrane. So what we did is we used PVDFTRP coating. And we have found that it is helping quite a bit. And again, we have applied for a patent on this application. And this course is published. I will just tell you exactly what is our result is. Now, membrane characterization is very important activity because it gives determines the internal resistance of the device. So you see water, water uptake here and proton conductivity. There are two important parameters. Why water uptake is required? Because water is important. Humidification of the membrane is important for two reasons. One is to enhance the proton conductivity and also enhance the lifetime of the membrane. If the membrane is dry, proton conductivity will be low and membrane, life, membrane lifetime also will be reduced. So you need humidification of the membrane. Okay, so membrane up, so we will study water uptake. So there are certain formula, I don't go into the details. Water uptake is defined as you know total water, percentage of water taken by membrane 
in terms of a weight. That is basically the simple definition. And then we have proton conductivity is just a conductivity of the proton and is defined in, in this year Siemens by a centimeter per centimeter. Okay. And then we have this uh, minus two, of course, uh, fraction. So this is the right side is the proton conductivity, left side is the water uptake percentage. So and it as we increase the PUD of TRP coating thickness, both come down, which is quite uh, reasonable because uh, water uptake will be reduced because of the coating. At the same time, membrane conductivity also will be reduced because of the coating. But what is the advantage? You see the right side here. It shows here. Now, different thickness of membrane here. Uh, we have Nephion 212, which is 50 micron, Nephion 1035, which is 90 micron thick, Nephion 117, which is 183 micron thick. Okay, so this is the status. Normally, we use 183 micron thick to reduce uh, permeability of uh, methanol in, uh, in the fuel cell, into, into the membrane. But if it's thinner membrane, you get, uh, you know, permeability, higher membrane and permeability which is not desirable. The mem de membrane permeability, you know, it is a membrane permeability is in the y-axis here, the navium thickness here, is the less, is increase the thickness. But at the same time, if you put 10 micron, 20 micron, 30 micron thick PUD of therapy, permeability goes down. You see here, uh, this is the 10 micron thick, red one is 10 micron thick, then blue is 20 micron. So permeability goes down as you increase the thickness. So suppose you take 212, this is 50 micron thick, permeability is more or less same as uh, 183 micron thick membrane. Okay, so this is the advantage. So you reduce the membrane permeability without much affecting the proton conductivity. So that is the key. You reduce the membrane permeability, methanol permeability in the membrane without really reducing significantly proton conductivity. So that is the, what we have achieved here in this uh, slide. And optimum is of course 10 micron. If you use 20 and 30 micron, conductivity drops down. So this is the point. So it's not much difference between uncoated and coated. At the same time, you get a membrane uh, methanol conductivity, uh, permeability comes down drastically. See here both for this and this. It doesn't matter for this because this is, uh, is already quite thick and uh, very low power you get from 180 micron thick. So this is the key and let me go through. We have also applied for a patent of this as I mentioned earlier. Now, what is the physics behind this? <coughs> physics behind this is very simple. We, we need the FDI spectroscopy analysis and you see the plots. Okay. Uh, absorbance versus wave number. This is for Napier 117, this, this plot, Napier 117, red one is pure PUD of PRP and uh, uh, this one, lowest one is PUD of TRP coated Napier with 10 micron thick coating. Now you see here, now what we have identified is the sulfonic acid group, which is 10354, 1054 is a sig uh, signature of sulfonic acid group. Why sulfonic groups? They are the ones responsible for proton conductivity by hopping in the membrane. This has been established and there are a lot of applications and this has been established. Quite significant results have been obtained. We are using this one, this signature, to find out what happens to the membrane with coating. Otherwise, naturally it's difficult to explain. When you put an insulating layer in a membrane, Energy is signal resistivity is same conductivity will come down drastically, but it's not coming down. Why is it? That's because as we have saw here, sulfur acid groups are still seen in the nephion with coating, 10 micron coating. <coughs> See, this is the significance. Okay, and there is no sulfur acid group in the pure PVD of clarity. So, what is the result? Why it is happening like this? We see the next one. Okay. <coughs> the only way you can explain is showing the evidence of sulfonic groups diffused into PUDF layer from the during the coating process. This is not actually spin coating, as I mentioned, is 
I made a mistake. It is uh, deep coating. The membrane is dipped into thin solution of PV deuterine. During dipping process, sulfonyl acid groups diffuse into PV deuterine from the membrane into PV deuterine. Okay. During the deposition process, that's the only way you can explain this one. Otherwise, there is no sulfonyl acid groups in pure PV deuterine, and you see sulfonyl acid groups in the coated membrane. And this is a base uh, membrane is with the groups. Which is responsible for H plus mobility by hopping conduction. So this is the important finding. Okay, now these are some details of surface morphology, the SCM, SCM pictures of the surface of the coated membrane. Cross section we have the nephew coated with POWP. You see the one micron thick coating here. See beautiful picture of the same picture. So it shows uh, so this work was done in IT1 actually. And he did an INE program, Indian Nano Electronics Users Project. Arjun is a student there. He worked there in 2018 and 19 actually. And this is a very nice picture showing the cross section of the membrane, thick membrane, and one micron, um, 10 micron thick PUDFT layer. Okay, now I showed that slide was shown earlier, but I'm repeating here. Now, what is the benefit? You said proton conductivity is not reduced very much. It's almost the same as the uncoated layer. But membrane, uh, but at the same time, permeability of methanol is reduced significantly. And that should be seen in the power. Finally, the proof of the cake is in eating. So you get the power density here, plot. You see here, uh, voltage versus current density, milliamps is in square. This is correct, in a current. And here, medium centimeter square and the power density plot here. Now you see here, uh, uh, this is of course voltage current drops. Uh, I mean voltage drop as you draw the current is all standard. But you see the power density plot. Uncoated for 183 micron is the low power density. You know why? Internal resistance high. So not very useful, but people use it for a long lifetime because permeability is, methanol permeability is uh, low. But at the same time, methanol permeability is high for this uh, is 90 micron thick. That's why you got a low power here and the high power here with coating. Okay. But if you use 50 micron thick methanol, I mean membrane, then the, uh, the difference is quite large. You see here, uh, the red one is coated 90 micron. This is 90 micron. This is 50 micron. So 90 micron is actually giving up, optimum, by the way, not 50 micron. So this is 50 micron. This is no, this is in, uh, in 50 micron. This is 90 micron. This is 90 micron. Coated 50 micron. And this is yeah. These are the, these are two relevant. These two. So 50 micron gives the highest power, which is uh, understandable because it's having lowest internal resistance. So ideally, 50 micron is better. Provided you can reduce the internal, I mean, reduce the methanol permeability, which you have done by shown here. Here, this is the coated 50 micron nephion, and this uh, this is uncoated nephion, 50 micron thick. From here to here, difference is factor of two, so that is very very significant. So this work has been uh, published in Journal of Hydrogen Energy, and also we have applied for a patent in this work. I one for examination now. Okay, this is uh, another important piece of work which we did is internal resistance, reduction in internal resistance of the nephew. That is the key, right? You have to reduce the internal resistance of the nephew hmm? by whichever way you want. One of them is expose it to UV rays. People have done a lot of work uh, and here we expose to gamma rays, UV, electron beam radiation, and so on. We did some work by exposing to UV radiation. And we just use the UV rays from the mass collider, MJB4. And then the schematic is shown here and exposed for both sides because H plus uh, hydrogen ions have to move through the membrane. And then we have again the exploded view shown here. You have the membrane here, exposed both sides, and you have the UV ray exposed membrane. So this is the we assembled, and this is the schematic of exposure. And this is the lamp from the MJB4 mask. Now, what is the effect? 
the effect is very, very significant. Membrane characterization is shown here. Water uptake, swelling ratio, porosity, proton conductivity, and the methyl permeability, all are shown here. All the four important characteristics, which are very important. Water uptake is required for you know, conductivity, maintenance, swelling ratio is also important, porosity, which is also important for proton conductivity. We should be maintained in the receptor level and proton conductivity is shown on the right side. These are the mechanical, these are the, not mechanical, these are important properties of the, this one. Uh, this is the electrical property, proton conductivity of the membrane itself. Proton conductivity versus dosage of irradiation, you see here. And we found there is an optimum dose of cross-linking. So enhanced cross-linking takes place, but when the cross-linking increases beyond a certain level, the conductivity drops drastically. And we found for this membrane, uh, uh, see, 212, 1035, and Nephion 117. That is 50 micron, 90 micron, and 183 micron. We did the work. And if all of them we found reduction in the uh, in the methanol permeability also reduced, but more importantly, we found uh, more important we found proton increase in the proton conductivity by more than factor of two. See here and then drops. And now what is the effect? Why it is conductivity increase? That is for increasing, you know, your optimization of the porosity of the thing, cross-linking. You optimize the porosity. With the result, you have a better permeability of the hydrogen ions in the uh, meth meth I mean the uh, nephian membrane. Okay. Now, why this is happening? Now, essentially, we again explain to increase in the sulfuric acid groups. This is the uh, FDI spectrum of the pristine nephew, shows various peaks. One of the most important one is the sulfuric acid groups, which is responsible for hopping conduction, which I mentioned earlier, which is in the 1000 to 1080 wave number range. And these are responsible for, you know, 1780 is responsible for uh, hydro hydronium ions group. And this is, of course, responsible for the strength of the nephew membrane itself. Hydronium ion groups, very small. That is responsible for direct conduction, which is very small, which is sulfuric acid groups are responsible for hopping conduction. SO3H groups are responsible for hopping conduction, mm -hmm. which are actually their signature is in the region of 1080, mm -hmm. 1054, which I mentioned earlier. That is the signature. Now let's see what happens. Now you see here, uh, when, when the optimum dose of 198 millim, you have the best. Uh, you know, the peaks of sulfur and acid group is obtained here at 180, 98 nanometers. Okay, this is the one. Whereas we have a problem here with uh, hydronium groups, H3O, which is responsible for direct conduction. Now that actually vanishes here. So this is the pristine, this is this one. So this vanishes, 198 nanometers vanishes. But that is a drawback. But the effect, total effect is positive because sulfuric acid groups, upping conduction is increased, greatly increased. On the other hand, this is a small contribution for, for direct transfer uh, of uh, H plus is reduced. But total effect of conductivity is positive. So you have a small negative effect and large positive effect. Effect is large positive effect. That's why you see in the in the in the increase in conductivity, proton conductivity. So that is the finding which we explained by using FTI analysis. Effective irradiation groups responsible for providing mechanical strength. This is another thing which are used, which we used. Also, the benefit of uh, UV exposure is increasing the mechanical strength of increased cross linking, increased porosity, but also cross linking, and increase the mechanical strength. That is, we have found there also. So 198 nanometers. So you see the peak here. 198. Mechanical strength is increased. There's a small difference, but still it is significant. Mechanical strength also is increased, which is important for long-term durability of the membrane. Now, what is the effect finally? Which is seen in the power, power output. 
As you see, the polarization plots again here. Yeah? Voltage was the current density, milliamps per square centimeter. The power density what is current density, milliamps per centimeter square. Here is the milliwatts per centimeter square. See here, you see mm, exposed, uh, optimum exposed membrane. So this is the highest one, 50 micron, EV exposed. This optimum exposed. Uh, this is the uh, EV rated 90 micron, this is 183 micron. Best performance is obtained, of course, with 50 micron. So this is significant increase in the uh, power density of irritating lithium. So this is an important finding, and which we have, of course, published and patented earlier. Another patent applied for this one for again uh, examination, and we found here yeah, this published, of course, in Journal of Energy uh, two years ago. So this is the work on UV exposed. So this is the kind of three works we have done, direct method and projects, which are of uh, very high quality, and my uh, student, uh, Chin Rao, who is a uh, John is a faculty here. To give some more examples of what is the, actually the platinum catalyst, how it looks like, this is the image, the same image of uh, nanoparticles of uh, platinum loading. And this is without loading. This is the membrane. Okay, this is the membrane. Oh, sorry, this is not a membrane. This is the gas division layer. Uh, platinum loading is not done in the membrane. It's done in the gas division layer. Gas division layer is a fibrous layer where methanol permeates and gas also permeates and gets converted into uh, into breaks into carbon dioxide and H plus. You see here, uh, distribution is not uniform. That's why this is one of the problem when the distribution is not uniform, the efficiency goes down. So you need larger amount of platinum for a same effect. So that is but cost platinum is so expensive. So naturally the cost of all these fuel cells are quite high because of the platinum, uh, which is a rare earth, an expensive rare earth. I mean, which is an expensive metal, sorry. And also, uh, rapion also is quite expensive because there is no other uh, membrane which has been found as efficient, low conductivity as in the fuel. Okay, this is the actual photograph we took, how the catalyst look like. Okay, now I am switching gears a little bit and uh, uh, you see here, as I mentioned in the beginning, a clean energy is required for the mankind. Food and clean energy, which are most important. Okay. Now, we have been doing using energy for a long time, or using fossil fuels, and the time has come where reduce the carbon content in the atmosphere to save this planet. And in direct methanol fuel cells, which are of course uh, done a good job, where we use the MEMS technology for making the fuel cell uh, flow channels, but the future is not in direct methanol cells, they are in hydrogen fuel cells. Why? Let me explain why. Hydrogen fuel cells require highly purified hydrogen as a fuel, of course. Researchers are developing a wide range of technologies to provide, produce hydrogen economically from a variety of resources in environmentally friendly ways. Okay, this is the beginning, let me just say, introduction. Now, uh, importance of hydrogen. Hydrogen is also secondary energy source, meaning it must be made from another fuel. Uh, of course, it's hydrogen is available in the universe, largest element known in the known universe, but that is not available in Earth, direct form, in pure form. So it has to be generated from secondary source. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of energy sources, including fossil fuels such as natural gas and coal, nuclear energy, renewable sources such as solar, water, and wind and biomass. You can generate, use this power to generate hydrogen. Sir, this is Farm 16 film. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking Hello? Now, how can fuel cell technology be used? Uh, okay. Before I go into the technology itself, let me explain why it is required. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a clean energy source. You go for transportation, station power stations, telecommunication, micropower. All ways, everywhere, 
hydrogen fuel cells can be used. Okay. Now, over 2,500 fuel cell systems have been installed all over the world in hospitals, nursing homes, hospital hotels, office buildings, so on. Okay. And most of these systems are either connected to electric grid to provide supplementary power and backup assurance or as a grid independent generator for locations that are inaccessible by power lines. So they are stationary power stations. Okay. Now telecommunications, and due to computers, internet and sophisticated communication network, there is a need for an incredibly reliable power source. Because our technology advancing so much, computers, advanced computers, internet, all these require power. If the power fails, then nothing will work. So you need a very stable power source and a clean power source. Fuel cells have been proven to be 99%, 99% efficient, reliable. I'm not talking about the cleanliness here, the reliability. Okay. Now, uh, the micropower also, it would be useful for micropower application also. Consume electro electronics could paint drastically, longer battery power, and so on. So, cell phones and so on, laptops and so on. Okay, what are the benefits of technology? Physical security, reliability, efficiency, environmental benefits, battery replacement alternative, and military application. Let me give you just this flavor I'm giving you just to slightly change the this thing from technical part into the why the, these are very important. Physical security, reliability. Efficiency, environmental benefits, which is a clean energy benefits, which I mentioned in the beginning, battery replacements, alternative, military applications. Okay, let me start one by one. Physical security, both central power station generation and long distance, high voltage power grids are prone to terrorist attacks, which will affect energy infrastructure. Fuel cells allow the country to minimize these risks from attacks. Of course, these are you know much smaller space they need compared to uh, you know, long term, the long distance generation. Even the solar panels, of course, require large area and so. Of course, nothing is uh, set that safe, but these are they increase the safety aspect. Well, cells increase the safety aspect because of their smaller size. What are the benefits and benefits? Again, the same thing. Reliability. Example, US. There's one report says US business lose seven twenty one billion a year, twenty one billion dollars a year. Computer failures due to power outages. More reliable power from fuel cells could prevent downtime due to loss of power. Properly configured fuel cells would result in much less downtime. Okay, this is an example. Efficiency. Because of no fuel is burned in, to make energy, fuel cells are fundamentally more efficient than combustion system. Initially, the efficiency aspect I will touch up later on, but just quickly go through this. Additionally, when the heat comes up from the fuel cell system, it can be captured for beneficial purposes. This is called co-generation. So you can also use that heat for another secondary power generation. Now efficiency, fuel cells now, here is the key. Fuel cell power generation system in operation today achieve 40 to 50% fuel to electrical efficiency. 40 to 50% fuel to uh, electrical efficiency, electricity efficiency, that is chemical to elect pure electricity. In combination with turbine, electrical efficiencies can exceed 60%. When cogeneration used, fuel cell fuel utilization can be exceed 25%. Environmental benefits, fuel cells can reduce air pollution today and offer the possibility of eliminating pollution in the future. So this is I, I started in the beginning itself with the green energy requirement. What are the benefits? Again, the uh, environmental benefits of fuel cell power generation. A fuel cell power plant creates less than 25 grams per pollution per 1000 kilowatt hours of electricity produced. 1000 kilowatt hours, so 1000 units of electricity produced, 25 grams. As conventional comb combustion generating systems produce about 10 kg of pollutants for the same electricity. Okay, 10 kg versus 25 grams. Now, 25 grams comes not from the hydrogen converting into water, but from allied usages. Environmental benefits of fuel cell vehicles. Okay, fuel cell vehicles with hydrogen stored in bo on board produce zero pollution in the conventional sense. The only byproducts of these fuel, fuel cell vehicles are water and heat. Okay. Now, of course, military applications are also very, very significant because of less space and less heat, 
it will be very useful to use in the battlefield. Handled battlefield computers can be powered by 10 times longer. It's fair cell power, meaning soldiers could rely on their computers in the field for longer periods of time. The issues with hydrogen. But what are the issues with hydrogen fuel? Why they are not really being used so much? Major problem in the use of hydrogen fuel cells are efficiency, cost, and lifetime. Efficiency primarily depends upon catalytic conversion efficiency and membrane proton magnetic, which I again I mentioned earlier in the case of direct methanol fuel cells. Estimated hydrogen conversion efficiency is 50 to 60 percent. Thermodynamic efficiency is 85 percent. Much higher than the internal combustion engine is 20-25. See the comparison. is more than double. 50 to 60 percent in practical conversion efficiency. Although thermodynamic efficiency is 85 percent. IC engines give 20-25. In, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, transportation, I'm talking about transportation. Now. So since here you see the difference. Okay, now but the challenge is is the cost. The cost of fuel cells must be reduced to compete with conventional technologies. Same thing happened in solar solar panels. Solar panels are much more expensive than conventional. But by 2015, although uh, a lot of panels came from, actually from China in 2015, low cost panels they dumped, and India requires a lot of panels. As a result, a lot of and solar panel manufacturing panels, our companies had to close down temporarily, but our requirement is so large, they open again. So, so there is one good thing that China did, dumping a lot of solar panels, low cost panels, low cost but high quality panels in India. And then, now we are still importing a lot of panels for large scale power generation solar panels. Conventional internal combustion engines, again, it costs 25 to 35 kilowatt. That is the capital cost. Fuel cell system would need about 30 kilowatts to be competitive. $30 per kilowatt and 25 to $35 per kilowatt. So that is the this is the comparison. Durability and reliability. Durability of fuel cell system have not yet been adequately established. That is because last year production has not been done. The durability standard for atom oils is greater than 200,000 kilometers under normal vehicle operating conditions, which you know, 200,000 kilometers. For stationary system, 40,000 hours of reliable power operation in a temperature range of minus 35 degrees C to 40 degrees C may be required for market acceptance. Challenges, these are the challenges. Now again, what are the problems? Lack of hydrogen infrastructure, need for refueling station, lack of consumer distribution system, cost of HFCs, carbon cost of producing hydrogen. Means producing hydrogen, you may be using, generating again carbon dioxide, okay? That is not going to help us. But you can use the solar power, solar panel to generate hydrogen. Then, of course, the carbon content will be extremely small. The problems is HFC cars is short range and warm up time and so on. This problem is the current problem. Okay. Okay. Now, fuel cell power vehicles, and this is the standard. Uh, I have taken some drawings, some reports. The, the, the stack, fuel cell stacks, power cells can be used in cars. But the problem is, Refueling station and so on. And also the storage part is a problem. Storage, there are other ideas are there, but I will not go into the storage part here. But that has been one of the biggest problems. Apart from the cost, storage is another problem. There are many different uses of fuel cells being utilized right now. Some of these uses are power sources for vehicles and such cars, trucks, buses, and so on. Power sources for spacecraft, remote weather station, and military technology. Batteries for electronics such as laptops and smartphones, sources for uninterrupted power supply, UPS. So all this, thing, everywhere you can use it, hydrogen fuel cells. Efficiency of fuel cells. As I already mentioned earlier, they are very efficient compared to other sources of energy. But this is an overview. <coughs> this slide is an important slide. This gives an overview compared to other sources of energy. Here is a fuel cell technology. I'm talking about hydrogen fuel cell, diesel motor, auto motor, and then steam and gas turbine. Okay, power in terms of kilowatt. As we increase the power, of course, efficiency increases, and the efficiency is low for small power generation. So it's, the nearest is diesel engine, but still is way below. Efficiency is 50 to 60 percent. Here is efficiency is 30%, here is a 20%. Petrol engine and diesel motor. Steam engine, you see, see this one. Yes. So, no way matching with fuel cell, hydrogen fuel. I'm talking about hydrogen fuel cell. 
All these are for infuse, not for direct method of infusions. Okay, work carried out. Let me, these are the overview of what is the importance of hydrogen fuel cell. In view of these, in view of the strategic importance of hydrogen fuel cells, and the way, uh, what the world is going and work, the country also is planning. Of course, battery technology, lithium and batteries are being used now. Will be, all the two wheelers and three wheelers will be converted into electric vehicles by operating on lithium and batteries. But fuel cells will be probably in the 2030s. Hydrogen fuel cells. So, in view of that, we thought we started some work, you know, two years ago, and this is actually in collaboration with TIP. It's my colleague Pritham and others. Uh, Silver work is going on with the new, new in situ generation of hydrogen in the fuel cell. We are working on it now. Now, what we did is we simulation of modified PM, <coughs> improvement of PM, this is protonic chain member performance. Coating with PUD to have an APO reduction. This is the work which we did with dynamic methanol fuel cell, which I already explained. Pore size tuning of nephron by optimized UV exposure for enhanced proton conductivity for its own performance. Design of prototype HFT. This work was done for direct methanol fuel cell, but pore size tuning of nephron by optimized UV radiation for enhanced proton conductivity and HFC performance. This work was repeated for hydrogen fuel cells with different student, okay, who is uh, currently uh, working, doing PhD, Pritham Kastlino and uh, others. And we did uh, design the prototype HFC. The design is very important because all the actual designs are not published. What is published is not, we can't really take it straight away, but we did our, make a, made our own design. Integration HFC from anode to cathode, Electrical characteristics for performance optimization quantification. All this work was done. Design was done here, but work was done by students, both mechanical engineering students and also PhD students at TIF. So, novelty of the work is the following development of efficient HFC with following novelty. Was the design of 70 mm by 70 mm aluminum sheet. We, Actually, here we did use the micro channels uh, defined by um, MEMS technology. We to you know since this metal is used, there is no MEMS technology required. So we use the CNC machine, uh, TIP, and also my friend's place uh, in Mumbai, um, Excel Instruments. He also developed the flow channels for us. Flow channel implemented using CNC machine. Design of in situ humidification set up by HFC. Now, humidification I mentioned touched upon in the direct material for yourselves. Humidification of the membrane is key. And why we do humidification? We humidify the hydrogen which is going inside. So that humidification setup we also established. And there are a lot of problems there. We solve that problems. Proton conductor enhancement with UV radiation by pore tuning in the APN membrane. This work was done by Arjun for direct material for yourself. And we, we used it again for HFCs. And again, went for another patent application for this. And we got factor to improvement even in HFC. High dispersion loading of nanoparticle platinum catalyst. So this, of course, uh, is required for both sides. Here, you don't need platinum and ruthenium because there is no methanol here. Hydrogen, you split into H+. Plus, and on the other side, also, you need platinum. For hydrogen, and H+, plus and oxygen, they combine together. I will go into this, the description of the circuit, but this just summarize the various points but of the work we did. Integration of prototype HFC from anode to cathode. Now what we have obtained is shown here. Proton connect to enhancement after UV radiation. I explained this different plot for that, but this is uh, work done with respect to the various membranes here. 2 and 2, 50 micron, 25 micron, 90 micron. Here we are not using uh, uh, 183 micron membrane because it's too thick and internal resistance too high for HFC. And HFC permeability, hydrogen permeability is very, very small, negligible. So we don't have to worry about coating and so on. So 183 micron membrane we didn't use. We used 212, that is 50 micron. If you want 211, which is 25 micron. And if you want 1035, which is 90 micron. And see the effect you can see here. Proton conductivity enhancement at almost at the same level. Uh, it depends upon the thickness, of course. And uh, this plots depends upon the thickness. This means the reason for that is there is a particular penetration depth of UV. 
thinner membrane requires lesser power, lesser exposure, UV doses than thicker membrane. So we are getting the, uh, where is the plots here? And you shown here. Optimum UV dose is, is uh, 150, 180. Uh, actually, uh, there is a mistake here. This is uh, 20 micron, 50 micron, this is 25 micron. This should be interchanged. So the dosage increases with the thickness increase. There is a mistake here. Okay, so I didn't check the slide. So 50, 25 micron, this is 211, this is 212, 50 micron. And then dose increases 150 millijoules per centimeter square, 180 millijoules and 190. So it was obtained 196 in the earlier case. It's more or less the same. So slight experimental variation is there. So this is the actual exploded view of the hydrogen fuel cell which you fabricated. Here you see the UV exposed nephron, you the GDL here, platinum anode for hydrogen flow channels. And you see the flow channels made in using CNC machines, more or the same size, 50 micron, 500 micron width and 1250 micron depth. Okay, and then you have the of course, we didn't use graphene was the plan, but we used, uh, there was no time, we used directly platinum only coated, uh, direct GTL, which is available in the market. Yeah? And then coated with uh, platinum, and we exposed membrane, and then cathode with oxygen air, this is again air breathing cathode, you know. Hydrogen goes through this, which we are not shown the details, how the hydrogen is put and how the oxygen is but there is a different, those details are not shown. It's only the block diagram, uh, exploded view of the basic hydrogen fuel cells from anode to cathode. Now, here we show the polarization plots of HFCs. The Nephion membrane thickness is 50 micron. We took the 50 micron because Nephion 50 micron is the optimum. Anything less than 50 micron, it is the reliability issue is there. It's 50 micron, and we found large increase in the power density. Uh, uh, here you see 350, uh, 350 milliamps. This is power density watts per centimeter square. So 350 milliwatts per centimeter square, the peak here with the uh, you know, current density, this current density, uh, flow rate and so on. So 20, 20 ml per minute of hydrogen without chrome gold uh, coating. And then this one is uh, for uh, this is for 25 micron gives better performance. Obviously, internal resistance is down. The reliability issue we have to check. But you got as high as 700 milliwatts per square centimeter. Very high power. 700 milliwatts per uh, centimeter square. Almost 0.7 watts in the square. For 25 micron membrane. Okay, current density. Okay, these are for all UV exposed plots. For UV exposure. So this is the situation. This is the important part, and this we are be applied for patent, US patent. I mean, the Indian patent. Uh, this is the improvement in the plot. Um, the, it is a factor of two higher, which is I am not shown in this uh, without any UV exposed. Now uh, this is a current level uh, publications here, and we have. Uh, uh, so you see, uh, Arjun's student, we did work with uh, HOD here, Dr. Manjanath, uh, on there, and my colleague here. And uh, this is the work on uh, fuel cells, uh, both uh, pore size tuning and also the PDF, TRF coating. And, uh, and the effect of microchannel cross section. So these are published in, this is, this is published in, uh, in terms of general hydrogen energy, this is in terms of general hydrogen, where this is the effect of microchannel cross section, which was developed using uh, MEMS technology, is published in the general micromechanics. Micro okay, uh, so this is, of course, uh, uh, material strength communication. It was uh, published how the effect of, uh, well, how to explain the effect of uh, uh, coating and uh, effect of view exposure by using this. Evidence for sulfur and acid groups, which are shown by FTR studies, spectroscopy analysis. Sulfur and acid groups increase with UV exposure. 
And this is, of course, work on hydrogen fuel cell. These two, the Pritham is working on this. And this is the work on done on uh, design of uh, initial design of hydrogen fuel cell and we uh, design of uh, uh, the UV exposed to hydrogen fuel cell, giving the much higher power density, factor to higher power density. And this is for design of optimum hydrogen fluoride and membrane electrode assembly clamping pressure in hydrogen fuel cell with dual serpent proteins. Uh, here, of course, he contributed in design of a humidification setup, which is critical for operation and long life of the thing. So these are all uh, publications, and of course, there are patents here. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, this hydrogen fuel cell patent with UV exposure, and again here, an Arjun's patent on microchannel performance. Uh, with the enhancement microchannel, my direct material fuel cell performance with the silicon vapor orientation. And of course, we have uh, enhancement of polymer electrode membrane performance using optimum view radiation. So this, these two are actually the same. This is on DMFC, this is on IHFC. So optimum exposure of UV rays. So this is the current work. And I think I'll uh, stop at this point. And after this, uh, you may, uh, you may, uh, are there any questions? Uh, what is the next stage? Hello, yeah, hello, sir. Yeah, hello, yeah, 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 yeah. Audience, uh, uh, there, are there any questions? Will be there, yes, sir. I'll just, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. It's any, any queries or any, any questions? If you have any questions, you can uh, turn your microphone on or you can even post your queries in the chat box. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, one second. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, I, Anujan MB, on behalf of uh, Department of uh, ENC, convey my sincere thanks for giving an inspiring presentation, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, even uh, thank you for sharing your domain expert with us, sir. And also thank all the audience for being a great listener. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And by this, uh, participants, we have come to the end of uh, session two of day three. And the session three will begin by uh, 2.30 p.m. So I request all the participants to join the meet in, in prior. Okay. Okay, thank, uh, you. thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. So it was all clear? It was okay, no? <laughs>